on what on what are the challenges you're facing and i think i agree a hundred percent these are all challenges that we are all facing so many times we don't know whether students are even with us or are they are they you know have they gone off gallivanting <laughs> somewhere else or whether they are uh, watching some movie on youtube while they've muted themselves so yes all of these are very very real issues that we are facing and during the course of this session we are going to look at what the tips techniques can we use to uh, to garner student engagement and ensure that students stay with us not only in mind not only in physical body but also in mind and spirit okay so thank you for sharing your thoughts i've put together a few points here right so i think uh, the challenges that we face can broadly be bucketed into the following five one is that both us faculty as well as learners we are not used to the online medium for learning and that leads to a lot of uh, challenges all these challenges that you spoke about you know that uh, the 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 face is not visible you don't know how much the student is grasping we don't know exactly how can we take our uh, physical class on a digital mode so all of these are issues that we are facing another covert issue that i feel is that knowingly or unknowingly we miss the sensory perceptions of the classroom you know there's a certain sight you know you see not just one person you see all these people and that's why i asked you all to switch on your cameras and keep them on because even in a virtual medium if you have uh, if you have cameras on it it uh, it simulates what what we feel in the classroom okay so those of you who switched off your cameras a cue to you if you can please go ahead and switch on your cameras even now all right so there are sights there are sounds you know sounds of the classroom where you know there's the bell ringing you've got the uh, sounds of footsteps you've got uh, you know the sound of the marker on the white board you've got all these sounds all of these sounds simulate learning and stimulate your learning rather then there are the smells right there's the smell of the classroom and and think about it go back to your classroom and and just you know just go back and breathe in the smell of the classroom now it may be a pleasant or an unpleasant odor but whatever it is it is something that uh, that that was familiar to all of us right and uh, right now we've lost that sense of familiarity also there was touch you know whether it was uh, whether it was you know a teacher handing out a handout or an assignment or whether it was you know uh, passing on various books from one corner to the other or whether it was you know students back slapping each other uh, or a handshake you know all of these these are all sensory perceptions which were all very familiar to us and suddenly psh, they've all gone right they've all they've all just disappeared and all of these are uh, lead to a sense of void between us and and if you think of it these sensory perceptions have a lot to do with what why we are finding it difficult to cope with the digital medium another thing that all of you have all uh, laid out very uh, very vociferously is the fact that uh, you know student you, you don't know whether the student has understood anything and in an online format that really happens you know students uh, go through the syndrome no one can see me so i can do whatever i want all right and it doesn't really matter uh, where where i am you know so many times i have a 10 year old you know i make sure that he's physically ready for learning right he's not just gotten out of bed and gotten straight into class he's actually you know had a shower and uh, you know he's got his work his his study station set and 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 you know all of that is done but i know so many people you know they'll just get on it right out of bed hair disheveled not even brush their teeth and they are in the classroom so all of these are uh, uh, are uh, syndromes that no one can see so it doesn't really matter and and they all impact learning 
connectivity is a regular issue with all of us. And the fact that students have these multiple, numerable digital distractions, right? So these are the issues, the problems that we are all dealing with. Anything that we've missed out, anything anyone would want to highlight that has been missed out here? I'm playing outdoor games with our friends together. True. Yes. So the the other aspects, the extracurricular aspects. Yes. True. Absolutely. Thank you for uh, contributing. In physical classroom, uh, we can uh, make out from the gesture of the student that uh, what we have delivered uh, is understood by them. While Absolutely. in the uh, digital classrooms, uh, we can't make out that the outcome have been served or not. That Absolutely. I think. Yes, yes. And, uh, and that's a big concern, you know. Have you understood anything? Have you not understood? Uh, so many times you say any questions and there are no questions. So, you know, I typically say, so is it all clear or is it all clear? You know, what is it? It has to be one of the two. Either you've understood everything or you've understood nothing. Otherwise, there's, there's not going to be a, you know, a, a case where you have no questions at all. Yes, absolutely. Anything else? All right. Thank you. Thank you for those contributions. We'll move on. Okay. So let's have a look at what are the implications of these problems. We've already discussed the problems. Let's Let's look at the implications of these problems a little more closely, okay? So, because the faculty and learner are not used to the online medium, unconsciously we get confused and we try to adapt to this not co in, you know, co cohabited uh, interaction. So basically, you know, there's confounding of the mind. How do I interact? Should I interact or not also? You know, there's a laziness, there's an inertia in the minds of the students there. There's one set that is going to be incredibly enthusiastic and you'll still see them giving all the answers. And the others are like, you know, this happens even in the classroom, but in a digital format, it, this, this particular behavior gets amplified that you'll see only a few enthusiastic students answering and the others are close to there, not there, you don't know. I hope you, I, I, I wonder if you all agree with that. Do you agree with that? That yes, yeah, this, this behavior gets amplified in the digital uh, format. Right. The next is that both faculty and students, because they miss the sensory perceptions, we un unknowingly, we don't even realize that the learning process has got inhibited. You know, we, we, we don't even know that these things added so much to the learning experience, right? The, the physical presence of the teacher in the classroom, you know, that brought about a change in the, uh, when, when you walked into the classroom, the mood of the classroom changed, right? Now you'll see that that mood, you can't, you can't uh, feel that because it's all, it's all digital. It's all on a network. You don't know if the mood of the classroom has changed. Perhaps, you know, if you get your students to log in a few minutes early and then when you enter, you'll, you'll still be able to feel that, you know, the, the kind of chatter goes down and, uh, the, uh, uh, and the jokes maybe go down. So, so, so there's still, there, there will still be some of that, but to a very large extent, you know, the, uh, the physical sensory perceptions that we were all very used to, they've, they've completely been eliminated. And uh, what they added to the learning experience, we now know because we don't have that. Students are lackadaisical. They don't have the right learning postures, environment, or setup. This is something we spoke about. Connectivity is unstable. And uh, this leads to low learner engagement. And learning can also become very severely impacted because of, uh, because of connectivity issues. And uh, when it comes to digital distractions, we need to figure out, you know, how to keep the mind share of the learner because right now on the same screen, there are so many options that are available. There are so many engaging applications that are available. I mean, I could see my 10 year old and 
cats, you know, 10 years of age, and they're teen chats while the teacher is teaching, they're all in the chat talking about some game that they're playing. And, you know, the teacher had to really scold, give them all like a verbal lashing when, uh, when they stopped me doing these chats. But, but, you know, look at that, the teacher is teaching and they're all chatting about, parallelly, they're chatting about some games that, you know, they're all playing uh, and they're looking at how to make it multiplayer at, while the teacher is teaching. That's also because they don't, they, you know, they're so young right now, they don't understand the implications, but as our students, our college students are older, they'll find out various ways to be digitally distracted while the teacher is teaching. And we are really, really uh, competing for their mind share. Okay, so we've talked about the problems, we've talked about uh, the implications of the problems. Let's now look at the delivery of learning assets using an online medium and, and see that within these challenges, what can we really do to engage learners and what are the different hooks that we can, that we can employ that can uh, hold on to this learner mindshare that we are talking about, okay? So <clears throat> let me start off by looking at some fears that we have as faculty, you know, while tackling a digital classroom. So I think fears or maybe beliefs, you know, both of these. A few faculty that we interviewed in the process, you know, said that what is so difficult about online, I can simply take the presentations that I did in the classroom and show it via an application like Zoom or Teams or whatever it is that we use. So it's the same thing, you know, I transfer whatever I have on, you know, ready material and I can use that and show it while using the online app. Another, you know, another fear that a few faculty told us is that I may lose control over my students. The third one said that, you know, the online format is more informal. A few people said that constant technology glitches may make online learning ineffective. A few said that the online format is less interactive as group dynamics don't work. And a few said that the online format is good, in fact, for knowledge delivery, but it may not deliver outputs and outcomes. Right? So what I'd like to do here is uh, take you to Mentimeter once again, and I want to understand what this group feels. You know, this is based on some feedback that we got on some surveys that we ran with various faculty. You know that I come from Varmani Global University. We deal with faculty development. So these were, you know, a few verbatim comments that came up, but I want to really get into the skin of this group. So I'd like you to go back to Mentimeter and tell me what you feel about, uh, about these issues. Just give me a second. Okay, let's do a quick hand raise on these. All right, so how many of you actually feel that you can use your presentations that are there, that you've already got prepared, and uh, use it uh, while uh, going on uh, online on Zoom or Teams? Can I see a hand raise? Both classes are working. Right. Hand raise or thumbs up. How many of you feel that? Professor Priyanka, is it possible for you? Yeah, yeah. Participants, if you are agree uh, to what ma'am is saying, you can click on reactions. So uh, there you will find uh, these emojis. Okay, so three people have raised hands and a few have given their thumbs up. All right, okay, so I think about eight, 10 of us agree with that. All right, can you just, uh, can uh, Priyanka ma'am, can you just lower hands? Yes ma'am. 
Can you just lower all hands? Okay, I've done it. I've done it. All right. The next is I will lose control over my students. How many of you agree with that? Can you do just a hand raise? Uh, there's a hand raise button. Can you do that? How many of you feel that you lose control over your students? All right, that seems to be like a really real fear, losing control over students. How many of us have uh, agreed to this? For five of us, eight of us, 10 of us? Okay, a lot of us actually believe that we don't lose control over our students, which is good. Great. How many of you believe that the online format could actually be more informal? From both the students as well as, I mean, from the faculty, I'm sure we are not informal, but okay, a few of us here. All right, four, five, six, Okay, a, a lot of us, 10, 12, 13. Okay, about 14, 15 of us. Okay. Wonderful. All right. How many of us now, next question, believe that the online format uh, is less effective due to constant technology glitches? Yeah, quite a few of us, yeah, true. Yeah, I think this one's getting a lot of interaction, right? Technology is something that really inhibits our learning. Okay, the last thing I want to ask all of you is, while the online format is good for knowledge delivery, it may not deliver outputs and outcomes, you know, good scores on the, uh, on, on assessments and, and uh, you know, uh, whatever, you know, getting students to get a job, getting trained for all of that. How many of you agree with that? All right, okay. So quite a few of us agree with this as well. Are there any other fears? Thank you so much for those responses. Are there any other fears that you have or any other beliefs that you have about digital learning that have not been covered in these six points that are there up on your screen? Any other fears that you have about, you know, about fair assessment is a challenge. Yes, thank you. Fair assessment is a definite challenge if you don't have proctoring. Yes, agree. We'll definitely add that to our list. Right, any other, any other concerns? Cyber bullying, oh, yeah, that's also true. Yes, online exams, yes, fair assessment, cyber bullying. Right, so, so all of these are, you know, various concerns that we have. Progress, uh, getting, yeah, e reaching out to slow learners um, and other learners, progress of students as well as teachers. Yes, I, I agree with all of that. True. So let's try and see what we can do in this format, okay? So one of the first points that we've spoken about is that assessment and assignment checking. Yes, that's that too. So, First thing is that if those of you who said that taking an online class is as simple as taking my own presentations that I did in a physical classroom and then, you know, just converting it and taking it as is to the online classroom, 
See, it's not going to be that easy. There's going to be a lot of pre-work and prep that is that is required. And I'm going to get into that shortly. So within us, we need to agree to the fact that a lot of preparation is required from us as faculty. You know, uh, to drive the right learning outcomes, we need to change completely, you know, like uh, we, we really need to take a 180 uh, and, and think about what we need to do differently. We're going to get to that shortly. Secondly is uh, the fear that those of you had that I will lose control over my students. Yes, you will. If you don't engage actively, how do you engage actively is something I'm going to get to again. The online format is more informal. See, it's as formal or as informal as you create it. So, you know, having some simple ground rules like uh, keeping your cameras on, uh, getting students to, uh, uh, to interact, telling students in advance that you need to interact at this point. Those are, so we'll have to really change the way we do it. So for example, uh, when we are doing courses with our students, we tell them in advance that, you know, um, that for, for this particular section, you are, you are going to be asking questions. So, so, you know, you have to listen to the concept that I'm teaching and you need to ask questions, right? So those are simple ways to do it. I'm going to get into a lot more as we go along the presentation. Constant technology glitches make online learning ineffective. Yes, that is true. But, you know, this is something that we can't really, uh, we can't really influence, right? It's, we can't control. Uh, we can get students to uh, invest in backups. And, and generally our students come from those, do not come from poor economic backgrounds where they cannot afford uh, an internet backup. But uh, let's let's try and get them to do do those things. You know, get a backup. Get them to uh, ensure that they uh, that you know if the, if there is a technology glitch, they come up to you and ask you for a recording of the uh, of of the classroom. All of these things are uh, are uh, things that we can do. Group dynamics uh, don't work is not true. You need to change the way group dynamics work, right? And uh, I'm going to get to how, how you can get group dynamics to work as well. And um, at the outset, it may seem that, you know, assessments, uh, assignments, learning, all of this gets severely impacted. But, but basically, we have to redefine the way we look at outputs and outcomes, right? So when it comes to an assessment, when it comes to an assignment, let's let's, you know, put back our thinking gaps on and see what is it that we are actually looking for this course to deliver. And then we have to change our assessment uh, accordingly. At Vadwani Global University, where we look at faculty development, you know, when I joined the university about uh, three years ago, everything was done face to face. You know, we used to have uh, uh, a seven day, eight day program and everything was done face to face uh, with the faculty and the master trainer being in the same room, cooped in for about seven days and that's how we did it. Today we have moved and even, even if it was not COVID, we would have, we, you know, because our scale is such, we've had to move the seven day entirely to a digital format. And uh, we've done this and, uh, you know, as a, um, uh, as a team, we're very proud to, you know, see that our outcomes have in fact improved by going, by going digital. And, uh, uh, you know, those of you who would like to speak with us separately on how we've done that in the field of both entrepreneurship and vocational skills education can speak to me separately. But, but our outcomes have actually improved. Our faculty are better prepared are more stringently assessed and uh, and we've changed the way we the way we are looking at our outcomes so see we are dealing with a heterogeneous group here so i don't have an answer that will fit that 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 will answer all your questions but my only advice to you is start thinking differently right and see how you can uh, uh, how, how what is the net outcome that you want to achieve when it comes to 
entrepreneurship courses we were looking at we are we are looking at creating entrepreneurs and faculty who can deliver the that kind of student and uh, we put together several processes that have helped in uh, in achieving that outcome let's move on and let's look at what you can actually do the real meat of the session you know what is it that we can do to engage learners so there are three things that i want to talk to you about okay the first is that as faculty we need to adopt a digital first mindset secondly we need to apply bird in hand principle you know bird in hand principle is simple you know a bird in hand is what do you have in your hands presently and how can you leverage it to its max potential and the third is how am i going to adapt okay so adopt digital first look at what's your bird in hand and how are you going to adapt let's look at these three points in more detail so what do we mean by adopting a digital first mindset firstly those of us who you know who come from uh, who come from that experience of being in the physical classroom and you know we we've not befriended technology we have to now make technology your best friend okay don't be afraid to uh don't be afraid to dabble in it don't be afraid to afraid to explore technology be willing to spend time in getting used to various applications you have to do a lot of testing and even despite the testing sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't right now i have done two rounds of test In, in getting used to various applications you have to be willing to experiment and then be forgiving and patient for your own mistakes you know every time you do this you you'll make a mistake but it's okay you know we are all on a very steep learning curve so be patient and forgiving to your own mistakes and those of others so if there is a challenge on internet and connectivity you know it's all right people may drop off they it will get you know there there will be a distraction it's okay you know you you have to be willing and patient to deal with all of these so these are a few things that i want you to keep on in your mind when it comes to uh, appro adopting a digital first mindset secondly remember that you are the expert at the end of the day no one knows your subject the way you know it right that is something no one can take away from you the modality will change but your expertise is something that you own nobody can take that away from you right so don't get flundered by by the modality and and remember that you are the expert remember that at the end of the day the material the learning material that is there is available to both you as well as the students so it's not as if the students are unaware of the learning material now there's a lot of pre work post work you know different things that you will need to do to ensure that the students really understand uh, you know how to uh, how to adapt or how to use this material but but you know all your entire uh, dependence on giving the students the material from time to time you know, take those away give the student all the material get them to become in charge of their learning remember those of you who said that stack tracking student progress is more difficult in an online format actually i believe the contrary tracking student progress is actually easier when you are leveraging technology in the digital format okay and let me spend a couple of minutes here giving you an example of how you can do so all right so basically so so basically you can you have to do some relentless quizzing okay do quizzes before they come into the session do quizzes after they go out of the session you know small questions on each topic that you are teaching and that is what is going to help you track student progress i've got an additional section entirely on quizzes and assessments so i'm going to come to this point in a lot more detail in the next maybe 2 or 3 minutes but those of you who believe that you know uh, tech, that tracking student progress is difficult take that thought out of your mind it's actually going to be uh, it's going to be i won't say it's easier 
but um, though i've written that but see you you'll have to invest a, a little more time but it will be much more uh, accurate when you're using digital format um you while using technology you can set in some inbuilt reminders to ensure that both you and your student are on track right various applications uh, google classroom teams all of these allow that i'm going to take a break here before i delve into the adapt piece that i have put together and i want to ask this question what are the various tools that you are using uh, to to run your classroom i mean how are you giving your assignments how are you uh, collecting them back and how are you giving feedback i just want to get a sense of the pulse of what is really happening on ground with all of you before i delve into the next piece okay professor hethel is saying uh, survey stories through moodle okay so uh, professor hartik you created your course on moodle you've created a parallel course on new moodle yes ma'am okay all right excellent okay anyone else what else are you doing so i i understand that professor hethel must be using videos for assignments that's that's a great way to do it okay giving them helpful activities that are created okay mcqs and short answer questions all right okay my i like professor hartik is using uh, moodle are there any other such applications that any one of you are using edo modo okay zoom breakout room google forms mentimeter okay quiz webex okay kahoot all right poll and breakout okay how many of you are actually using google classroom socrative great Google Forms and Google Meet. How many of you are actually using Google Classroom? Can I just can you just type in why so that I know? Yes. Google Classroom. okay so two of us yes okay students actually wait for it yes professor hidal right so uh yes google classroom is a i i'd like to talk about google classroom a little bit those of you who haven't started using it you know try using google classroom it's one of the most easiest ways to uh, actually go ahead and deliver uh, you know all your material to your students in a very easily consumable format right and if you'd like us to you know uh, give you some tips on google classroom we can connect connect uh, with you separately um there are other you know such ways as well there's a teachable there's thinkific you know these are all other um they, these are all other websites that you can actually use to create all your material and put it together and you know do it like a slow drip you know as you're completing one topic then you give the next assignment you you open it uh like like you lay, you know peel the layers of the onion you can do all of that using these uh, uh these uh, uh teaching tools google classroom teachable thinkific you know do a little bit of r and d on these three okay let's now move to the to one of the biggest pieces you know which is the adapt so how do you adapt your infrastructure what's the first things that you need to do is uh you know adapt uh your internet you need to have maybe you know two connections on the minimum so that uh, so that you don't get disrupted 
you need to have a computer with a camera don't use the webcams and uh, earphones with a microphone you can use any kind of earphones noise cancelling ones you can use you know a lot of my colleagues use um, uh, microphones which are you know they've invested in a good microphone um, i'm i i still am okay with you know the regular headphones and and they work well i can't emphasize the importance of having a good room uh, a lighting a room with good lighting and no echo that in itself leads to such you know such a change in the classroom experience you know if i just change my you know i'll i'll just do a quick demonstration of how your experience would change if i was sitting in this way right if i was sitting like this you can see the bed on the side you can see some light coming from here and and you know uh, and you can imagine that i'm not you know i'm probably not sitting properly or if i were to keep the laptop on my lap like this and speak you know so that you can see my ceiling or you can see my double chin uh, probably the hair on my face you know i don't know but all of that leads to such a big uh, you know impact on the classroom experience so this way when you sit and keep your face to the camera you know that you've got your laptop and your cam and your uh, desk at the right level that leads to that leads to a tremendous improvement in the way the, the students are going to perceive you right and think of it in the same way you know you got dressed up to go to college right yeah. right now it doesn't matter what you're wearing underneath but it really matters the setup really matters because right now there are a lot of uh, sounds that come in uh, which which are which are the non verbal cues that students pick up right the sounds the way you're sitting the way you're dressed at least this part of you has to be really good and uh, and students need to know that they are in a professional environment when they are sitting with you uh get if you're using zoom then get the pro version of zoom if you're using teams it's fine but be very well conversant with all the features of zoom it doesn't take too long and zoom is doing a lot of these um zoom does a lot of these free webinars which gets you acquainted with all the features of zoom so you know how do you do your hand raises how do you do a quick poll on zoom how do you uh, look at the chat messages how do you use emoticons on zoom all of these are very uh, good ways to uh, to leverage zoom you can even use zoom for feedback surveys you know right after the session you can send out a feedback and that's something that students really like you know and you can track okay you didn't give me feedback that means were you listening or you not listening right so those are various ways that you can use so infrastructure extremely important and whatever we told you please pass this on to your students as well tell them that they need to do all of these okay and uh, for my 10 year old these came in as a uh, as instructions as guidelines for the parents so you know we we also were adapting for our for our kids and giving them some kind of quiet place to study so i'm sure you can you can give this to your students as well now i'm going to come to a very important piece which is your content and how do you take your existing content to the digital format first thing that i'd expect all of you to do is critically analyze your content okay and see what is it about my content that is not fit for online delivery now this is not going to come easily what you need to do is you need to run the session in your head before you actually deliver it right and this is like that one time effort that all of you did in putting together your session plans when you took them to the physical classroom now that you are going digital that one time effort will need to be reinvested all right it's not going to be as rigorous as the first time because you know uh, you've got all the material but now you need to think of how do you make the most out of that one hour a lot of times what we do is that we give the entire reading material or entire material for that one hour to the to the students before they come into the session and that's what we call the flipped classroom right and i'm sure all of you as educators are well aware of the flipped classroom methodology anyone who's not aware of flipped classroom if you're not also it's fine i can just take like a minute to explain it 
anyone who's not aware of flipped classroom you can just type an n and i'll just spend a minute okay Okay, so a few of us are not aware. So just for 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 the purpose of uh, so that everyone's on the same level, flipped classroom is where the students actually do the study before they come into the classroom, into the actual class, right? And uh, the way we the way we do it is that we give all the material and we tell the student do this and come to the class in advance and be prepared with your questions. be prepared for activities that we are going to do together online right and that is something that changes or puts the entire onus of learning from the faculty to the student so when that ownership of learning is now with the student now they can't say my teacher doesn't teach me or my teacher is boring or my teacher is this my and all of us have said this and i'm sure all our students say this about us also right so you you shift the onus of learning from from yourself and you give it to the student and you say that you have to come prepared with it all right and once you do that when they come into the classroom you will see that the classroom is so much more uh energetic because either either there's no energy then you know that they haven't studied at all or there is a lot of energy because they've come studied they and and now they've come with some questions which are that were evolved questions right they're not the very basic you know skimming the surface kind of questions you need to set objectives for the session all right i'm going to get into the flipped classroom um, in more detail towards the end of our session so i'm not spending too much time on that right now but uh, i've just given you an overview of what is flipped classroom because it's important for the next few points and then i'm going to delve into how you can run a typical classroom in just about a uh, in just about 5 minutes from now so um, so let me move on to the next point so setting objectives for the session is very very important and the way we suggest that we set objectives is uh by putting together a statement that says by the end of the session you will be able to solve you know uh, debit and credit questions in accounting with x level of uh complication or you know whatever however you want to put it or you will be able to define uh quantum you know quantum force or you may be able to analyze critically analyze uh, the the pros and cons of a particular business strategy so basically you need to set your objectives very 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 sharply we you know we constantly do this as an endeavor in fact now it's become such such a second nature to us uh, within the uh, wgu varmani global university that we set objectives for even a meeting that we get into you know so what are we looking to achieve by the end of this meeting what where should we be so that really sets the tone for us that okay if this is where i want to be by the end of the session what do i need for my pre work how should i begin marinating my students minds before they come into the session what should be my session plan what should be my post work and how will i assess the learning so see it sounds very simple and uh, we all i mean i think we all do it but uh, there is a there is a definite amount of rigor that is involved in this to do it for every session there is a rigor that is involved and there's this one time effort i would encourage all of you to do right set objectives based on those objectives decide what's going to be the how are you going to marinate the minds how are you going to do a session plan within that what is going to be my post work what do i want my students to do after this and then how am i going to assess in your session plan we advocate relentless chunking what do we mean by chunking anyone what do you think we mean by the word term chunking
Okay, so in the interest of time, I'll go ahead. So chunking is basically slicing and dicing your session. You know that that I I do my chunking in 10 minute slots. 10 minutes, I'm going to cover this. Next 10 minutes, I'm going to cover this. Next 10 minutes, I'm going to cover this. And between every 10 minutes, I will keep some time for interaction. All right. Now that 10 is like a ballpark. You know, it could be 8, it could be 12. But whatever it is, I want there to be time for some kind of interaction that happens with, within this changeover. Right. And that is that one hour is then effectively divided into six such chunks. Right. And six chunks, I know exactly what I need to deliver in these six chunks. So basically, I break it down into smaller digestible pieces, not only for me, but also for the student. They also know, okay, there's a flow from this. Now we are moving to this. And now that we've come to the next point, if they, if they ask questions which are pertaining to the previous point, you have to tell them, listen, we already covered this before. Okay, so I'm going to spend maybe a minute, but, but not more than that, because you know you need to move to the next point, right? So relentless chunking. Like I said, between two chunks, keep some time for student interaction. And in the digital format, recognition of effort, the, the impact of recognition of effort cannot be, under, uh, cannot be underestimated. This has so much power. And in your hands, you have this, this, you have like a Brahmshastra, you know, you have like the ultimate tool in your hand, which is recognition. Use, use this recognition and use it differently. Um, you know, don't use the same method all the time. Use some surprise rewards. Sometime, you know, uh, you can you can go ahead and give maybe uh, an additional point. You can uh, you can use if if there are some budgets with you, you can use some Amazon vouchers. You know, maybe a small voucher. Uh, you can also use uh, uh, a kudos card saying that great, you're doing really well, and I want to appreciate you for this. And, uh, and put it up on the WhatsApp group, put it up, uh, put it up, you know, for, for everyone to see. You could, uh, you could uh, use, I mean, depends on what, what you have uh, available to you as resources. You can use various ways to use surprise rewards, rewards which are not anticipated, right? Because when I get something that I don't even expect it, Aha, that's like my aha moment, right? So, so that's what you should use. And then obviously you use something like a leaderboard, right? And uh, this is uh, going to be, you know, using a leaderboard is going to constantly tell you which student is performing uh, how, right? And this leaderboard, uh, I'm going to come into, you know, after I've done the flipped classroom, I'll tell you how to use the leaderboard uh, really well. Uh, through the flipped classroom methodology. Okay. When it comes to activities, uh, you need to remodel the activity so that it can be you, so that it can be designed for an online format, right? So there are various collaboration tools. You know, a lot of you are already using Zoom breakout rooms. There's Google Meet. There's Hangouts. You know, all of these are various ways that you know you can get students to be there. There's another uh, free virtual tool, uh, tool that is there, like Zoom, that, uh, that you can also use. It's uh, going to come into you, you know, a list of such tools is going to come into you in the post work that I have set aside. So all of these tools can be used by you to change the way a particular activity is done. And uh, so that you can create an online engagement with your students. Breakout rooms by far is the best because you can go ahead and keep, you know, moving from one room to another, right? And that's going to help you see what students are doing. Webroom.net is another free such tool, you know, it's an alternative to Zoom where you can also create breakout rooms. It's called webroom.net. So those of you who don't have the version of Zoom in which breakout rooms can be used, you can also use that webrooms.net. Okay, but breakout rooms by far have the uh, best, uh, you know, best efficacy. It's in entrepreneurship, which is a very experiential course, we have activities after every concept. 
So, you know, uh, that, that drives learning and takes them to application. So that is something that you will also need to do in your classroom and uh, web room or breakout room. All of these are ways that, that you can do it. Assignments. Um, so one of the ways to do it is, you know, get, you do proctored assignments or proctored uh, ways of doing it where students have to do it online. But if an online assignment is not required and offline is required, you know, you have to build a sense of community on the WhatsApp group. Be more approachable, be like their friend, philosopher and guide and, uh, and motivate students to seek whatever clarifications they have on the WhatsApp group. If you're using Google Classroom or Teachable or Thinkific, then you have already got, you know, um, there's an option for you to create like an entire stream, a conversation stream on that. And every conversation is recorded, which is why we are highly advocating you to move to any of these so that then there is free flow of communication between you and your students. When it comes to quizzes, and this is something I said I'm going to come to, one of the ways to track learner engagement is to use quizzes relentlessly. And I already mentioned this, that it requires a considerable one-time effort, but this is effort that is well invested. So, for example, if you've given them some reading material before they come into the session, right, you can give them a set of three questions, not much, maybe just three questions that students should be able to respond to before they come into your class, right? And there are various tools that you can do to create these quizzes. The toolkit that I'm going to be forwarding to you has many such tools that you can use, right? So do that in an online format, use quizzes uh, before they come into the session. When they come into the session, also you can, you know, after every concept, just ask one question, one provocative question, an application-based question, which forces the student to think, right? Um, it's not necessary that only you have to put together these questions. Remember, you can leverage the student's brain power as well. So what you can do is you can get students to, you know, you can allocate students and tell, you know, for a particular section, you know, uh, for example, student A has to prepare a provocative question, an application-based question, and has to ask this in the class. So this way you do a round ruble, that way everyone keeps getting um, engaged and the leaderboard keeps going up, you know, based on the kind of question that is asked, whether the question is a good question, whether it's an excellent question, you know, you can, you can keep giving scores on the kind of questions. You can also give scores on the, uh, on the correctness of the answers as well. So use this leaderboard inventively. Post class, anyway, you've got various quizzes that you can use to check the learning of the students. Uh, all of you are already aware, but I'm just going to still mention it. You know, the power of using question banks, using randomization of answers, using randomization of questions, setting a time limit. All of these are ways that even if you don't have a proctored exam, you can still get a pretty close assessment of the students uh, of the students understanding and grasp of the uh, uh, of the subject right so pre class and in class you know they are all used to, these tests are used for uh, for learning and there's a concept called testing enabled learning right wherein you use tests to actually drive learning so i'd like you to those of you who've not heard of this concept of testing enabled learning or the testing effect, you could write in to me and I could give you a paper on this, right? So testing effect or testing enabled learning, one of the best ways to drive learning and get students to uh, understand their concepts and, uh, and, and clarify them, right? Uh, and uh, post-class, do create, if you need, you know, if everyone has to answer 10 questions, create a question bank of 20, Ensure that everyone is, you know, the questions are randomized, the answer options are randomized. And while you're creating these tests, you need to do a couple of user tests yourself. So do that. And uh, then uh, give them a time limit. It's difficult, to, it's difficult to cheat when all of these factors are in interplay together. 
let me now move into the flipped classroom so like i told you that in the flipped classroom methodology there are two parts you know what students do on their own and what happens in the session so when the students come before the students come into the session they have to watch uh, they have to read all the material and you can give them some reference videos somebody mentioned that you know students love watching these uh, videos so you can give give them some reference videos to watch ask them to post some clarifications on the whatsapp group so you know uh, this is one great indication of whether the students have actually gone through the material or not now whenever you ask students to ask you questions they are not going to ask you questions you know that's like that's like natural any questions no questions is usually the answer so that's when you need to think innovatively and you know use the pre class questions that i asked you right before you come into the session you should answer these three questions that in itself will tell you how many of them have gone through the reading material or not and they should be you know very simple questions if they've gone through the reading material they should know the answer to the question three questions five questions whatever it is so once you do that you'll know who has read what and to what extent they've actually understood it that will help you actually create a great check in session so you start the session by showing the learner progress so you know when when you put that quiz you show the analytics of the quiz and say you know out of 50 people in my class 25 of you have taken the quiz that means at least 25 of you should have gone through the material the 25 of you who have not gone through the material i mean i don't know what to say to you so you already address those 25 and said that you know you probably should not be there in my classroom and if you see that trend then maybe you you know you need to use other uh, tools that are available to you for those 25 who have taken the quiz now you know which concept they are actually struggling with so you know how to spread that chunking that you had done where you need to take one concept down to 5 and where you want to take one concept to 15 because it requires that amount of time right so show learner progress review whatever was you know given as an assignment from the previous week the session in itself needs to be done through question based discussions right so the more questions you ask the better the engagement is going to be within the questions there are two kinds of questions there are rhetorical questions and then there are provocative questions rhetorical questions are those do you think like i'll give you an example do you think driving engagement is important in a virtual environment what's the answer to the question yes of course so that's a rhetorical question but a provocative question would be like what are two things that you can do in your classroom today that is going to drive learner engagement forces you to think right so when you are doing question based discussions spend it on uh, on provocative questions so so actually analyze the quality of questions that you are asking all right establish the what and the what's in it for me how is this going to help you move forward right in your subject get volunteers to present get them to prepare and present you know the one of the best ways to do it is get them to prepare present and then you fill in the gaps in the understanding debrief build add on perspective reinforce the with them and you know drive your engagement by telling them that this this quest this uh, concept of you know whatever literature is important to you because tomorrow if you want to become an editor then this is how it's going to enhance your editorial skills you know whatever it is uh, it, and and i'm not getting into more examples because all of you are you know experts in your own field here provide clear instructions for what they need to do at home get them to collaborate for their activities and assignments uh, get your logins from them and uh, ensure that you know uh, you can peep into their rooms anytime get them to do quizzes all right so with that i come to an end of my session i've taken a few minutes over and i apologize for that uh, dr priyanka that's completely uh, <laughs> okay ma'am uh, thanks a lot ma'am for uh, sharing your views with us 
now I'll be uh, sharing some of the questions uh, sure. that our participants have posed. Yes, sure. So participants, you can uh, send your questions to Dr. Priyanka Zala. Considering the time frame, I think I'll be able to take two questions. So I already have received one. Um, if you can answer this. Uh, sure. Talk about your uh, experience of uh, uh, you know, taking hybrid courses at uh, Vadwani Foundation since you are associated with uh, Vadwani Foundation USA. So I think uh, this is the question that uh, one of participants have posed. If you can please answer to this. What is the question again? What is my experience of? Yes, your experience of taking hybrid courses at uh, Vadwani Foundation. Okay. So uh, hybrid courses are basically uh, what we call, instead of using the word hybrid, we call it blended learning. So blended learning is basically where it's, you have an online course and you have, an, and you have a class that are both running together, right? So the online course is exceedingly well suited for us to track uh, learner progress. And uh, also to not only to track, but also to record learner progress, right? And uh, that, uh, that uh, basically everything, all the students, uh, the, the amount of time the student has spent in reading the material, going through the videos, doing the assignments, activities, all of these are being tracked. We have various quizzes assign, uh, and assessments that are available as well. So all of these things are being tracked by us uh, and, and the online course helps us give us, you know, throw up these analytics. Uh, the physical classroom goes ahead and in this case, the virtual classroom goes ahead and cements the learning that the student has already had, right? And uh, whatever gaps there are in the understanding, the, the classroom helps to do, to cement those gaps. Also, the classroom helps in getting students to ask very relevant, pertinent questions with regard to moving their ventures forward. So that is something that really helps. Even in the vocational skill space, students ask very relevant questions, which will help them to get a job when they move out of the course. I hope that answers the question. Uh, whoever's asked the question, if you have a follow on, please let me know. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, your wonderful answer. Now, the second question that we have is what aspects of the online lectures will you apply to offline teaching once the face-to-face -face teaching starts to sustain the participation of the students? So, I believe that we are at a cusp because uh, this phase that we are in right now where you know, where we are learning to go digital. This is going to completely reinvent the way the classroom, when we go back to the physical classroom, the learning is not going to be the same. You will see a completely different classroom if you apply the techniques uh, that work well in the digital class. So all this flipped classroom, using quizzes, using, uh, you know, getting students to take ownership of their own learning, these are all going to reap incremental benefits when you go back to the face-to-face, -face, right? Provided you continue using these tools and techniques and you don't uh, slip back into your previous avatar, right? So if you continue to use it, it's going to completely reinvent your learning experience, your teaching experience, and you will see that the results are going to be that much more um, tangible You'll see better scores. You will also see better uh, job, uh, you know, better performance on job interviews, better performance in, uh, in, uh, you know, in, in when, when students go and start working as well. Right? Does that answer the question, Doctor? Yeah, ma'am. Thank you. Because uh, that's what we want, right? All of us want uh, students' participation and engagement in the class. So I'm sure today's session will certainly help us in you know, increasing students' participation and uh, engagement in the class. Uh, thanks a lot for enlightening us with your uh, insights. On behalf of JLS University's Faculty of Business Administration and our BPA, we look forward to more such interactions in the future. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.
Thank you, ma'am. Uh, okay, we'll have our next session on uh, planning digital pedagogies uh, by Dr. Bhushan Trivedi at uh, 12.30 p.m. sharp. So you may uh, stay online or in case if you wish to log out, you need to join the session at uh, sharp 12.20. Thank you.